Uh, happy Monday to everybody. Thank you so much for turning out and joining us here today. My name is Jim Steyer, and I'm the CEO of Common Sense Media. And you can I'm applaud with, for that. Yeah. And I'm here with my running mate, and uh, <laughs> actually with our very dear friend and colleague, Will Obey, the dean at the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Southern California. <laughs> Please give her a big one. Um, and we think we're going to have a very interesting hour uh, discussion with you today. Uh, basically, we want to talk about the impact of this, cell phones, social media, and other devices on the lives of kids and families here in the UK. So for a tiny bit of background on why we're here. So Common Sense Media is the US's leading organization focused on the impact of media and technology on kids and families in schools. Um, we are headquartered in San Francisco and have offices around uh, the United States and today are coming here to launch our presence and offices here in London and in, in Europe. Um, but we are very fortunate to be able to partner with some, not only of the leading experts in the United States, like Willow and the Annenberg School at SC, but also Dr. Sonia Livingstone, who's going to be joining us in a second for a discussion about the new research we've done. At Common Sense, we, our focus over the past 15 years has been the extraordinary impact that technology and media have on the lives of kids and parents. Um, and we've had, uh, we, we undertake a series of initiatives on our three platforms. Uh, as we'll talk about today and over the course of our time here in London uh, in the next couple days and, and longer term, we are also a ratings organization that rates every movie, TV, video game, website, books, apps, music. That's our consumer platform, very popular in the United States. And we actually have millions of users here in the UK, although we've never marketed to folks in the UK, so it's going to be fun to actually be over here and have a presence here on the ground. Uh, we also work in about 75,000 schools, uh, which are uh, members of our organization, and in the field of what we call digital citizenship, which is a curriculum and courses in K through 12 education in the United States, focused on the safe, ethical, and responsible use of media and technology, um, what we call driver's ed for the internet. And uh, I bet that's a pretty valuable, uh, I think it'll be a valuable set of courses and curricula for folks here in the UK as well. And finally, we're a large child advocacy organization on everything from the issues we're going to talk about in the research today to things like bullying and, and, and how to lift uh, disadvantaged kids out of poverty and give them the opportunities that all kids deserve. So at Common Sense, we always say we rate, educate, and advocate. Those are our three large platforms. And the fourth thing we do is investigate, which brings us to today, because we have a large research uh, platform where we look in a systematic way at the impact of media and technology on kids. And increasingly, we do that in partnership with Willow and the USC Annenberg School, which is really, I have to say, even though I'm a Stanford loyalist, <laughs> the premier, uh, the premier uh, communication school in the United States, which is why we're so fortunate to partner with them. Um, and we began about a year ago in addition to looking at the impact of technology and media on young people's lives and families' lives in the United States, to look at it on a global basis. So about a year ago, Willow and I went to Japan and presented the first ever study about cell phone usage and addiction, attention, distraction issues among Japanese youngsters and their parents. And today, we're doing the second in what we expect to be an ongoing series of international studies about the same topic, and, and we will be presenting the findings of this report, The New Normal, Parents, Teens, and Mobile Devices Here in the UK. And in a minute, Willow is going to get up and, and, and give you the highlights of that uh, research. And then we're going to invite Dr. Livingstone up with us, as well as the true experts, <laughs> which are young people who can really talk about how they use their cell phones for better and for worse. Um, it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, it is, it's great to partner with Willow and the Annenberg School. And I would just say, we were, Willow and I were just doing a, a, a conversation with uh, an important media outlet here. And I think that what I would tell you in the context of our discussion today is that we're at a truly watershed moment. We've been working on these issues at Common Sense on a very large scale, really from the beginning, 15 years. But in the past six or seven years, as Common Sense has become a very large NGO, um, we have been trying to get the attention of 
of the public, parents, kids, everybody, but also industry leaders, government leaders, et cetera, about the extraordinary positive benefits that technology, comma, used wisely and appropriately, comma, can have on, on families and on kids and on education, but also to point out so many of the unintended negative consequences that technology and media can have when not used appropriately. And if you really think about the last year, the passage of GDPR and in its enactment this May in Europe, the fact that we at Common Sense led the passage of a landmark privacy law in California uh, in June of this year, modeled after GDPR, by the way, we're happy to acknowledge that Europe and the UK have been leading us, the United States, on these issues. And we probably couldn't have passed that landmark legislation in the United States without the leadership of GDPR and the EU and folks here in the UK. But we are really seeing a watershed moment when people from all sides of the spectrum, this is not a partisan political issue, where we're starting to see industry leaders, like we're going to announce uh, later today our partnership with Sky, but where industry, government leaders, educators, and most of all, parents and young people are saying, we need to look at these issues in our lives more thoughtfully. We need a broad, balanced, common sense approach to them. And we really are living the new normal because our lives have been transformed, whether we like it or not, by media and technology. So it's up to us to figure out how to do it in a really good way. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague and good friend, Will Obey, the Dean of the Annenberg School, to give you an outline of the findings of this new report and then to invite up Sonia Livingstone and our students for discussion. So thank you and bless you all for coming. Thank you, thank you Jim. Um, and thank you. It's fantastic, first of all, to be um, launching this report detailing <coughs> the media habits and attitudes of parents and teens in the UK. But it's also one of the things we were talking about being here in London, but in, in the UK, was one of our goals is to support this conversation, to contribute to a meaningful conversation we believe needs to be happening in families, in communities, in countries, and in regions, and to support additional research and questioning. And I think when we look at this room today, it's an indication of just how robust the conversation here in London is and across the UK, where we have media companies, the media that I think here has played a critical role in advancing this conversation, along with policymakers, and as Jim said, um, perhaps most interestingly for all of us, um, teenagers and, and college students. So thank you all for joining us. So. I'm going to walk you through some of the findings from the new normal, starting with what did we do? Well, we knew that we needed to dig deeper into the media habits and attitudes of parents and teens. So we undertook a large national survey of 618 pairs, parents and teens. So we talked to parents about their media use. We talked to teens about theirs. and then. What's unique to this approach is that we got them to reflect on the other. We used, as I noted, a national sample. And I just want to point out that a large national sample, no one study can ever fully capture the phenomenon uh, of device use and uh, media use. But we actually believe that this method really helps us de de dig deeper um, into habits and attitudes. So Tina, let's advance to what do we discover. So broadly speaking, what we noticed was teens and parents describing quite clearly the ways in which digital devices are rewiring daily life. They're on them early. They're on them often, and they're on them with a degree of urgency. Also, we call it, I call it ADC. They're reporting feelings of addiction, distraction, and conflict. And while we have those, I think, um, a growing awareness of the unhealthy dimensions of device use, it's also juxtaposed against a significant amount of optimism about the role of these devices in our lives, and frankly, a lack of concern about their impact on parent-teen relationships. 
So let's take a look about the ways in which I think it's most clear that these devices are rewiring family life. Early, often, and urgent. We asked very specifically, not uh, excluding the use of the phone as an alarm clock, which we recognize that, that many particular teens do. Um, Parents and teens told us the vast majority are on their devices within a half an hour of getting up in the morning. Half of teens are on them within five minutes of waking up in the morning. Um, wh what happened to t brushing your teeth first thing in the morning? That's clearly gone the way of the cell phone. Then they're checking them often. And again, both parents and teens, 58% of parents and 66% of teens are checking them once an hour. And these devices <laughs> exert a powerful pull on us. There's a real sense of urgency to respond to text and other notifications that come through. 50% of parents and 65% of teens say they need to respond immediately. We have a new relationship, clearly, in our family lives. And it's a demanding one. Daily distractions. How many times a day are you distracted by your device? Half of parents, half, are distracted at least once a day. 54% of teens feel they're distracted at least once a day. Now, it's no surprise if you ask parents, parents viewing their teens um, believe that 72% uh, of their teens get distracted every day. But also significantly is kids are looking at their parents and seeing distracted parents. 44% of them are watching their parents buried in their devices. <laughs> Feeling addicted. Now, just one note, we do not use this as a clinical term for addiction. We use it as a way of capturing, right, Jim, the, the sense of dependency that many feel. Um, one in two nearly half of both parents and teens say they feel addicted to their mobile devices. And something that I think is clear from this data is that both parents and teens, this is a shared phenomenon. This is not simply teenagers attached to their devices. This is very much parents and teens mirroring the similar behavior in their home. Another note about this notion of feeling addicted. Look, it's alarming for sure, but I also see it as a positive sign that parents and teens alike are able to articulate these feelings of dependency and acknowledge them. You know, the way I describe it is it's a little like, you know, the hot and heavy stages of a romance is starting to cool and we're able to look at it with a slightly leveler head and I think this is indicating that parents and teens alike, families are really understanding um, to a greater degree the unhealthy dimensions of their device use. Emerging source of conflict. Look, we're in the midst, as, as Jim was saying, we're in the midst of a watershed moment. I think central to the conversation we're having um, now are the ways our devices are hijacking our attention. And in fact, they are emerging as the new family conflict zone. One in five, 20% of families argue about this every single day. 50% argue about it on a weekly basis. So how does it stack up with some of the other things that we tend to argue about? Well, parents say screen time ranks third behind bedtime and chores, the all-time classics for things that parents and kids um, argue about, and just ahead of homework. Now, I'm sure, and our students can tell us, I'm sure it's because um, kids in the UK are way more studious than clearly, kids in the clearly. US, because I was actually surprised to see that that was only fourth uh, on the list of things that they argue about. But clearly, this is emerging as a conflict zone um, in family life. We asked parents and teens, do you have rules about devices in your house? And two thirds, 
of them said <laughs> yes. And what's interesting is that uh, parents and teens were actually in fairly close agreement whether they had rules in their house. So to the extent that there are rules, parents are communicating clearly enough uh, that teens are hearing them loud and clear. Now, whether those rules are broken or not, 30% of families who do have rules say that no one breaks the rules in their house. Uh, no surprise, teens tend to break them a little bit more, but still there are significant numbers of parents also contributing to uh, the rule breaking. But again, I think, I think it is a testament to the fact that this conversation has advanced as far as it is, that that 66% of families have some rules in place in their home. So a lot going on on this screen, but this illustrates, I think, pretty powerfully um, the outline that I provided at the, at the beginning, which is we have increasing signs um, of awareness about the unhealthier dimensions, addiction, conflict, sense, um, distraction, juxtaposed against significant feelings of optimism. So teens and parents both are quite clear that these devices are doing a fair amount of good in their lives. S actually, 60, um, 62% believe that what's really critical about phones and mobile devices and digital media, actually, is that it's teaching kids important tech skills, skills that they'll need to succeed. But others say, more than half, as you can see in virtually all of these, um, they're great to help teens pursue hobbies and interests. They're tools of creative self-expression. And they're helping them to prepare for work in the future. So just to reset, as Jim noted, we started what we thought would become, we hoped will become, a global mapping project. Because we think these devices are reshaping family life in varying degrees around the world. And we wanted to get a sense of what that looked like. We started in Japan, grounding our work in the research that Common Sense has done with parents and teens, and now, now in the UK. So how does how do UK families emerge as distinct? Well, first of all, more parents in the UK feel addicted to their devices. More parents in the UK feel the need to respond immediately. And again, with that interesting juxtaposition of the uh, optimism that sits side by side um, with the growing awareness, teens here seem to be less concerned than their counterparts about spending too much time on their mobile devices. Now, what's interesting is that we started this roughly a year and a half ago um, with the first wave of research. And I think it's indicative. Some of these signs, um, the families in the UK are suggesting that they're feeling more addicted. It's a greater source of conflict of concern. Is both a reflection of the greater uh, degree of ubiquity, right, the presence of these phones in our, and devices in our lives. Um, Sorry, what are we looking at? Can it punch us down a little bit? But also the fact that the conversation has really focused on this notion of dependency and addiction and the problematic use. I think that's, that is um, much more central to the time that we're living in, even than it was a year and a half ago. One of the things that, that, that we were noting is the speed with which we have seen um, these devices become ubiquitous, right? While wireless technology is the fastest diffusing te communication technology we've ever seen. And we're all grappling um, with the unintended and unanticipated consequences of this at warp speed. What we're seeing when we look around the world in our very small universe of three countries <coughs> is that there are common themes that are playing out, right? Their teens and parents are feeling addicted in all three countries. They're checking their devices frequently, early, often, and urgently, as I noted before. And at the same time, in the majority of countries, 
teens and parents are saying, you know what, we don't think this is actually harming our relationship. The vast majority of teens, in particular 97% here in the UK, think it's either helping and certainly not hurting their family relationships. And I think this is one of the things that maybe, Sonia, you'll help us dig deeper into as to how we're getting how it is that we can have these two sitting side by side, and what are some of the ways that we think that young people are using these devices, and families, frankly, are integrating these devices um, in significant ways. So I think right now, I might, Sonia, invite, I'll slide over, invite you to come up and join us. Okay, thank you very much. Shall I come here? Yep. yep. How, oh, no, why don't you wanna sit, why don't you sit near, closer okay. to the, kids, and I will properly introduce everybody. Um, as Jim noted, um, we've been fortunate to have these extraordinary partners, and Sonia Livingstone from uh, LSE is one of them. She's a professor in the um, Media Studies, uh, Department of Media and Communications. She's an author of some, I don't know, 20 books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, an expert in the field. She's the editor of the blog Parenting for the Digital Future. Um, Sonia particularly focuses on the opportunities and risks of media use in the everyday lives of children and young people, and she really offered us invaluable guidance. One of the things that we are doing with these reports as we move from country to country is we're keeping some of our data core and consistent. Um, and again, it's grounded in the work that Common Sense has done in, in the US, but then we're tweaking questions as we go. And Sonia offered us some fantastic input into how we could adjust some of the language in our questions and add some questions, because as the conversation evolves, um, we wanna be able to capture what's current um, in the communities that we're surfacing. And so, Sonia, I'm gonna have, I might have you now slide over here and invite the students up as well, and then we'll get everybody seated and situated and then we'll start with your reaction. So you guys can just come on up while I'm calling out your names. So Alessia Ascolani, she's 17 and in school at Queens College in Harley Street. Libby Regan is 17 and attends American School in London, as does Izzy Harris, who's a senior at the American School in London. Uh, Luca Vicini is 16 and he attends Coleridge Community College. Sophia Hodgson is 17 and she's at Guilford High School. And uh, is it Izer Onadim? Izer. Um, Onadim from Dulwich College. Did I say that right? Dulwich College. Dulwich College, I knew, I was close. So first of all, thank you all um, for joining us. It's great that we got you out of school for the day. It's great that we have real experts um, on hand. So welcome. And Sonia, welcome to you. Thanks, because you. you've been invaluable to us throughout, yeah. this, I know, we should throughout say, this process. I just would say, I mean, number one, as many of you know, Sonia is about the top expert in the UK on all these issues. So we're, Willow and I, and we're very proud to have Sonia as our colleague on this. But also, it's great to have you guys here, because we know who the real experts are. So let's have a fun time hearing from you guys about <laughs> what these new studies all right, say. So Sonia, I, okay. might start, I might start with you. Yeah. Um, what do you make of the studies, and are there further questions that they raise for you? Yeah, well, it's uh, first let me welcome the research. I think um, it's been it was been great to be part of the um, to seeing it develop, and um, always good to have more research. I often say to some of the folks here, um, more research is needed, and it is. But more research raises more questions, doesn't it? So you've probably noticed that you've arrived in this country at a moment when there is a whole panic going on about mobile phones, internet, um, young people's mental health, and the role and how much of the problems that young people are facing today we can attribute to device use. And it's in that kind of context that it is really interesting to discover from your survey that British parents are the most anxious about their own, quotes, addiction, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and that the teens agree that their parents are, quotes, addicted more than they do in the US, more than they do in Japan. Yeah. So there is something going on. But I, I put that together with the um, finding you just presented about conflict. Mm -hmm. So parents and teens seem to be conflicting about screen time, 
But what I think you found also, and what we found in Parenting for a Digital Future, is they're not conflicting so much about what they're actually doing on the phone, what, what mm -hmm. sites they're visiting, you know, what are the kind of risks and opportunities. And curiously, I mean, I might say it's time to invert that. Let's stop panicking about how many hours, how much people are looking at the phone, and let's instead have a more nuanced conversation about what actually is good for kids, and what is perhaps harming their mental health, and what are the ways in which we can change the particular kinds of activities that they engage in, and that their parents engage in. And what do you make about the feelings of optimism, and the fact that on one hand we have children and parents <coughs> looking at one another, and mm. concerned about their distraction, concerned about their um, feelings of addiction, yet mm. saying, you know what, this absolutely makes no difference in mm -hmm. our family relationships. Oh, I think the, the the question was, does it make things better or worse? And it does, and, and it no has difference. a and yes, yes, but it but I think the the kind of interesting thing is like how parents and teens, how families are kind of reconfiguring around these phones. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if family life is exactly the same as it was 10 no. 20 years ago, but people are finding, you know, what do they prioritize? I think this is, uh, these guys will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is a generation of teens that actually really values family life and often talks quite positively mm -hmm. about their relations with their parents and vice versa. There's quite a lot of effort on thinking how to keep family communication good and kind of trusting. And so I think people are finding ways that the phone can be um, sometimes a positive support within that. And okay, sometimes parents are annoying and teens are annoying and we all need to go and do something else instead and look at our, Shocking. you know, and what is on our phones? It's our friends, it's our work, it's the news, it's, you know, it's entertainment, it's... Um, one of the things that yeah. I enjoyed from this is the, um, that one of the ways in which um, families indicated that the phones really help when it was when it comes to travel. Yeah. So we've completely ended the mom, am I there yet? Are we right. there yet? Dad, right. are we there yet? Well, By being almost. able to be distracted, <laughs> occupied, otherwise entertained while sitting on a plane or the back or the back mm. of a car. Mm. Now they're in yeah. the back of the car telling you what the directions are. Right. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Thank, thank goodness. I, mean, I think one of the other things about this kind of addiction discourse. Um, and the sense of going to our phones is I think very often we, we all go to our phones, we go to our phones when we need to look something up or do something. But we also go to our phones, I think, and I think this is what I'm hearing from teens especially, when we kind of can't control the circumstances around us, when we're having to wait because someone else is dictating that nothing is going to happen for a while, or when we're, you know, when, when one might be stuck in your room because you can't go out and see your friends because everyone's too panicked about safety on the street or you're not allowed out after. So there's a lot of phone use in those times to kind of fill in when you kind of can't be doing what you really want to be doing. But I've, I think yeah. one of the questions that I'm going to be interested in hearing yeah. from you guys about that is, is sort of, A, the compulsive use of a phone, mm. as opposed to just, it's okay to be bored. Mm. And, and, mm. and how, I mean, I actually think boredom is a very good thing. So I'm going to be very interested mm. to hear whether or not, yeah. because right now you can use a phone constantly <laughs> and never have to be bored because you can always look at your phone. And, 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 and by the way, the only other thing I'd say, other than having to feel lucky to be up here with you guys is, we're both parents. We're parents. We have kids about your age. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very interesting to hear how, how you all <laughs> experience all this. Are we, do you want to go into yeah, it's great. asking him some questions? Why don't you, you want to go? I, 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 I asked, I asked him first. earlier about okay, boredom. Good. Okay. So, uh, and there were some good answers about, you Let's know, whether, are you ever bored? Um, does the phone solve the problem of boredom? Uh, I think in many ways it mm. exacerbates it. Uh, okay. Because okay. you can you know use your phone for hours and hours yeah. and then at the end you've wasted time and you're still bored uh so <laughs> it whilst it solves boredom maybe uh it prevents you from doing something that would actually help alleviate the boredom mm -hmm. and just sort of n sort of dulls the pain of boredom for a while mm. before it just gets worse <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? So did you all did you all basically take this survey yourselves? Like did you, you took a look at it? And so was that we asked um, <coughs> teens, how would you feel if we took away the phone? Boredom was the was the most answered of the choices. Um, did those choices ring true to you? The list of possibilities? Anxious, relieved, bored. 
I think in some respect, I felt a bit relieved mm. without having that constant pressure of yeah. having yeah. the phone there and having to use it. I mean, nowadays, we live in a modern world of technology, you know, having the phone is instant. Everything is instant. Yeah. We live online. Um, if someone sends you an email, you're expected to reply instantly. And they'll send a follow-up email if you haven't replied instantly. And I think almost without having that barrier and that constant pressure, it actually, personally for me, helps me a bit. Because mm -hmm. I don't have to just live in that society. I can take myself away and do something else. Do, so, do, you, do you think we could change that? I mean, I'm, I was struck that the survey also showed that British parents are the more likely than in the US, let's say, mm. to feel that they've got to answer straight away. And yes. I can't remember the yes. finding for teens, but that's pressure that you are applying to each other. Could, you, could it be changed? Could you say, oh, I'll answer that you know, tomorrow? I think as a teen, I mean, we've grown up with that. We didn't mm. necessarily have it in our childhood, but phones came in. I had my first touchscreen phone at 14. That's what I've grown up with in my adolescence. Mm -hmm. and the things that happen in your adolescence do have an impact on the rest of your life. And if you're yeah. starting young, we see so many kids these days, like age nine, with their phones mm. and they live on their phones already. And if yeah. you start like that, I think, you know, it just, it's a means to go on. So Sonia, were you, get, were you getting at, with that, with that follow-up question, that a sense of urgency to respond, is that a sense of urgency share between parents and kids? <laughs> yeah, go on. I definitely bit, think yeah. it is because my mom is always like, when I'm with her, she doesn't want me to be on my phone because mm. she wants me to converse with her. Right. And so <laughs> I like to take that out into my own social life. So when I'm around people, I would prefer not to be on my phone right. so I can mm -hmm. get to know people and meet people. But then if she's texting me, where uh -huh. are you? What are mm. you doing? When are you yeah. coming home? And I'm not replying because I'm mm -hmm. technically doing what she's saying by not being on my phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I always get a bit conflicted here. Of what does she want from me? But mm -hmm. I think that it's important because she wants me to reply straight away. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I, I guilty. Yeah, yeah, but I, see, I'm not guilty. I'm not, I'm okay. not guilty I'm in this guilty. way. Because I, I don't think this is a male-female issue. But I want to do a, two, I have a couple of questions for you guys on a follow-up. So, I, I, and I have four children, as I said, who are relatively your guys' age. So one, I, do, I think, do you, one, does it add a lot of stress to you? The idea that you have to respond. Is, is, and second, to your, to your point, because I don't feel my kids, I don't feel the need to respond to, to somebody's text or email to me. I do not. And people who work with me know that. Because I, I don't know why, that has, why do you have to do that? It never happened to happen before. Why do you have to constantly respond to somebody? But my question is how much stress is added to your lives now by the ubiquity of the phone. Because sometimes when we frame this for policymakers, we frame it as a public health issue. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at this issue more broadly, whether, for, say, from a regulatory standpoint here in the UK or in the United States, trust me, we frame it as a, a health issue, a public health issue. But stress is an issue of mental health. Mm -hmm. So how much do you guys feel stressed by the constant pinging, if you will, and the need to feel you have to always respond? Um, I feel that it's very much dependent on the person. So mm. I know that I'm a person who loves my alone time. Yeah. When I'm at school, I'm always with my friends. We're talking right. all the time. And then I'm home. And I love to be <laughs> by myself at home with my family. So I don't necessarily feel such a stress to reply to my friends or anything, especially because if it's a family message, I see that as urgent to reply. Okay. But if I'm at home, I'm with my family. Yeah. So most pinging on my phone and messages and things <coughs> from my friends, which I know that they'll always be there. I can always message them later. I can speak to them at school the next day. And I'd much rather spend my time at home with my family, conversing with my family, tell them, telling them about my day. Whereas my friends, I've been with them the whole day. So I think it's very much dependent on the person. I know some of my friends love when they get home, they're immediately on FaceTime with one of their friends who they were spending the whole day with or messaging them immediately, which is really nice to stay connected, which is another factor that kids love staying connected. Nobody wants to be sort of disconnected from what's going on, what's happening at this moment, especially on weekends. But I know that personally, and even some people here, they very much like their alone time and their family time at home, staying disconnected from their phone. Mm. So, yeah. 
should ask Luca, do you want to pitch in? Does it, is it stressful, the phone? Do you feel that confidence in demanding your own alone time? I guess I'm a bit younger than everyone here, being um, 15, almost 16. And so my issues, I guess, are still a bit immature. So <laughs> maybe I don't feel stress as in I have to reply now, but I do stress in what I have to reply or how the other person will take it because um, communica communicating across the screen is a lot more difficult than in real life because mm -hmm. you don't have the added, maybe the facial expression will give it a different message. So I always need to be really careful of how I'm speaking to people across mm -hmm. the screen by messaging mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what stresses me out mm -hmm. more than anything. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I do take a while to reply, but that's because I'm thinking about Thank what I'm going to say. And mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Can I, can I ask? Is yeah, your sure, sure. yeah. question as well? Yeah. Sure. So there's a discussion in this country about whether we should, whether the phone should come with all the notifications off. There shouldn't be any pinging. There shouldn't be any interruptions and flashing and calling your attention. Would that help? Or do you think you just turn them all back on again? Um, I'd probably turn them back on again. Mm -hmm. I, I think that at times it's important to get notifications, um, especially if they're like from your family members asking you like where mm -hmm. you are. Um, but I definitely have turned off like Snapchat and Facebook notifications because mm -hmm. they're just they just give me another reason to like look at my phone for no mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. and what, what platforms are you guys on mostly? When, I know you're on your phone, right? But what are the platforms you're most on? I would say Instagram. Instagram mm -hmm. and then Snapchat. Snapchat next. occasionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't really use Facebook, but mm. or school. Twitter. Sometimes you need to have Facebook because our school in particular, the American school, we connect through Facebook groups for mm -hmm. clubs and stuff, yeah. and that's how we arrange mm -hmm. meetings mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Izzy, you said you were on Twitter? Yeah. And how do you use that mostly? Uh, a lot of like the companies that I follow, they use Twitter, so it's good to get like notifications on like what they're doing, and I can only really do that through Twitter. Mm -hmm. You follow companies? Sometimes, yeah. For, to what, to see how their financial performance is doing this way? Yeah, just to like see like what they're doing. Uh -huh. Like, who do you follow? What companies? Like Apple, Samsung. Mm -hmm. I think I follow like okay. Twitter. Tech Twitter. companies. Uh, tech companies. But, yeah. How much do you curate your image on, uh, on, on your platform, like on Instagram? How much, do you spend, how much time do you spend curating your image that you're sending out to the world? Well, that's um, to everybody. I feel for my Instagram in particular, I only really accept um, people who I know, people who know me personally. I won't sort of accept someone that maybe I've known through a mutual friend. So I think on my Instagram, I'm being very truthful in a way with who I am mm -hmm. because the people who follow me, they know me. So most are school friends or friends that I've grown up with. So if I'm acting as someone else, they'll immediately pick up on that and sort of question me about it and be like, what are you doing? So I feel on my Instagram, I just like posting what I like and sort of doing my own thing and not pretending to be somebody else in a way. So you guys are sounding like incredibly sensible and balanced and thoughtful. So, um, you know, maybe there's no problem. I mean, I'm, you know, there's a lot of attention now from um, mental health experts yeah. and the government and indeed the platforms. Like, should they do something different? Should there be, and maybe it doesn't need to be with you guys who seem pretty sorted, but maybe around yeah. year seven or year eight when people are starting secondary school? Is that a time when better advice is needed or different kinds of action? What I definitely you, yeah. think that when you're younger, you, yeah. you kind of, you're going through puberty, like your self image is changing. You're mm -hmm. more, yeah. you know, self-conscious about yourself. You're wanting to put out the best image of yourself. Like you said, um, with Instagram, you're wanting to curate the best image of yourself to put onto others. And I think we're seeing that start a lot younger. Um, like how, uh, there young, are how young do you think? There are 12 year olds at my school mm. who are already concerned with their kind of image online. Because yeah. um, I said earlier, we didn't grow up with that. Mm -hmm. It's not so much applicable to us in that respect. I feel like we're more happy and content with ourselves now. But to younger people, I think it can really affect them. Mm. Do, do you have any, any of you have younger siblings that you see you know, mm. engaged? 
I guess, Luca, yeah. yeah, I do have a younger sibling and he does have Instagram and Snapchat. And I guess me and him, we don't post as much mm. just because maybe we think, what will other people think of this? Mm. And I, uh, unlike maybe other people on this panel, I accept friends of friends, mm -hmm. maybe not everyone, people I don't know, but I do accept most people. And uh, so I guess I'm really careful about what I post. I've um, archived posts so people other, other people can't see what I've posted. And to stop this, I created also a private account. So an account where I accept the people I know personally. And there you're a bit more free than you are on other accounts, I guess. And so that's how I've been, how I've tried to be myself on social media. And it, I think, Izzy, you mentioned that you, uh, you did turn off or turn on the notifications on your phone. Um, would you all, now we're just starting to see, particularly, for example, on the iPhone, um, rolling out more tools that allow you to um, restrict your privacy in a different way, to, to limit your screen time in, in, in very helpful ways. Is that, are those tools that you would be likely to use, are those tools that you would welcome, whether, the, whether it's the device companies or the platform companies like a Snapchat um, or Instagram are starting to roll out? Is that, are, do you think on balance those are helpful and would you use them? Yes, I, I, I do. Um, mm -hmm. I did beta testing for iOS 12, which came out with the new Screen Time app, yeah. and I use it like all the time. How do you use it? Um, it kind of just like you. I guess you opt into it, and it kind of just tells you, kind of based on what the apps are labeled in the App Store, yeah. your breakdown of how much time you spend on each app, mm. and it kind of really gives you like a good um, image of like what you do on your phone. So we worked with Apple on that. So I, and they just released it, you guys know this. So I'm interested, so do you actually, are you checking every day? Do you actually check to see how much time you're spending? Not every single day, but it's like in my notifications, I, I see it every now and then when I feel and like. And did you change what you've done? Do you change which apps you spend time on now that you see know how much the time? Um, or? I don't really change like mm -hmm. my screen usage, but I'm definitely a lot more aware Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. what apps I use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What yeah, I mean, I completely mm -hmm. agree with that. Uh, I also check, but I don't really act on what I see. You know, I could mm -hmm. be spending hours and hours on a certain app, and I don't really do anything about it, because usually I'm, sp I'm finding it useful, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not just wasting time on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing my emails, you know, I'm learning something about a topic that I need to write an essay on or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, I have an app on my phone that sort of will give you points for not picking it up. Um, <laughs> so okay. the Can longer I you don't do anything on your phone, the more points you get. But the thing yeah. is, there's no real, like, there's no, I can, if I really need to, if I need to answer an email or something like that, I can still pick it up mm -hmm. and still do the useful things. But when it comes to wasting time, it helps me prevent okay. going on my phone for something that isn't necessary. Yeah. I like the okay. gamification of moderation. Yeah, okay. right. Would you like your parents to have this app as well? What's the name of the app? Yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, I think it's called Forest or something oh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Forest? Yeah. Forest, yeah. That moment. No. No. Forest, okay. Yeah. And, and, and because here we have this research saying British parents, British teens think their parents are more addicted than in other countries. I mean, have you got a message for parents? <laughs> are, are, is there a problem? Are they staring at their screens instead of talking to you? or? Maybe addiction is just the label. It doesn't really mean there's a problem. Personally, I don't. I don't find a problem with mm. my parents' mm. phone usage. Uh, mostly, they use it for things that are actually useful. Uh -huh. you know, uh, it's so. It's. It allows you to do so many things that it's mm. just completely impractical not to be on your phone at many points in the day. Wondering about the the dynamic in your family. So we discovered 66% of families have rules about device use. Do you all have rules that, in your homes? No. I wouldn't say it's a set of rules. I think it's just a common, mm. we, we share the same idea like. about phones. So at dinner, for example, mm -hmm. we would all decide that we wouldn't be on our phones. <laughs> and occasionally, you know, you look at the phone when it has a little ping, but we try to <laughs> keep it down so we can mm -hmm. talk with each other. You bring them to the table? You bring them to the table. Yeah. 
I think, yeah, for the most part, it's kind of sitting there. Because I think the issue is that it's almost become a second nature to grab your phone and look at it. It's not even that I want to look at my phone. I think it's more that it's there. Compulsive. Yeah, it's just, it's compulsive. So I think going back to your idea of taking it away, I felt relieved because I didn't feel the need to reach out for anything mm -hmm. because it just wasn't there. Because mm -hmm. my issue is I wouldn't say I'm obsessed with my phone and I actually have been trying to limit my time, especially senior year when there's so much going on, there's just no time. Because once you reach for it and you look at it, even if, you, if you're not looking for something in particular, you end up looking at one notification and then that brings you to another notification. And like he said, you end up spending so much more time on your phone that you just did not need to spend looking at nonsense. So we have a campaign at Common Sense called Device Free Dinner. We're gonna end with it. Um, which, is, which is no phones at the table. It's, and not like you can put it there, because by the way, we have a colleague, Sherry Turkle at MIT, who's done research on this topic, which is even if it's there, mm -hmm. and, you, even if it, and, and you turned off all your notifications, which I would recommend, so it doesn't ping you all the time, um, that you can't help yourself. That even if it's there, it's distracting to you, but the other people too, because they're w expecting mm -hmm. that there'll be something. So that the simple, we have, and we have a rule in meetings at Common Sense, not always obeyed by everyone, including myself, but, which is put your phone away. You know, we don't want phones on the table because we want you to pay attention to the people you're with. What do you think about that in the context of your guys' relationships with each other and with your family? Those kind of roles. Um, Alessia. I think it's really important to have sort of policies like that where if it's sort of out of respect, so if you're at a family right. dinner, you want to be paying attention to your family and you want to be conversing with your family. You don't want to be distracted sort of by the outside world. And likewise in meetings, you don't, you want to be paying attention to your colleagues. You don't want to show disrespect by having a colleague speaking and then you check in your <coughs> phone, you seem uninterested and uninvolved. So I think especially at my house, we don't have phones at dinner. I leave it in my room, my mom, leaves it in her room, also on silent most of the time. And in my family at 11, we all got our phones. So my older brother and my older sister, we were all 11 years old. So you get really excited mm -hmm. at that age having your new phone. And so my parents told me, me and my siblings just once, no phones at the table, leave it in your room, you can go on it after. And there was sort of a mutual respect, like that's fine. I'll go on my phone after dinner. This dinner's just for family and just for speaking, so. So if you all were going to give um, advice to policymakers, mm. to technology companies, educators, your teachers, and your parents about how to help, you all are veterans now, right? You've grown up with these things, but there's, an, there's another generation coming of age with devices um, right underneath you. What advice would you give? to all of us who are engaged in this conversation about how to, how to optimize or, or, or use these things in the healthiest possible way? Uh, well, I would say that restriction is not the right way to go. Uh, if you try to restrict kids, they'll just sort of rebel and it'll just cause problems. <laughs> but I think the best thing to do is information and education. Uh -huh. yeah. So like the sort of apps that tell you how much time yeah. that you're spending on your phone. Because when I first looked at that, I was sort of pretty horrified, pretty surprised. Uh, you spend more time than you think, usually. Uh, so I think the best thing to do is to educate and uh, inform people on how much time they're spending. And then they can just think, you know, I could have spent all that time doing something else, something way more useful. So yeah. I also think, especially for setting a good example for the new generation, is that they look up to their peers and up to their elders, so to speak. <coughs> um, and so I think that we need to show them a good example by, so we have to make the first step by limiting our time. And then they'll see that it's not normal to be on your phone all the time and you need to be able to put it down so you can converse with people and they'll mirror your actions. And I think that's, that will be very useful. Important message to parents too. Uh-huh. Izzy, did you? Do you think you spend less time outside now than, than, I mean, than kids did, say, 15 or 20 years ago? How can they know? No, I'm just wondering. Yeah. I, I, that's fair, but that's a yeah. good point. But do you think, I, but I still ask the question, do you think you spend less time outside do you, do you spend doing as much unstructured stuff because you always yeah. have something there? Or would it be good to be able to go out more? 
Would you rather be able to have more freedom to go out in the evenings or the weekends? Or if you think maybe about yourselves when you were 13? I don't know. I think I spent more time inside when I was 13, like just uh -huh. watching YouTube. Um, but I, I feel like I feel like more. Like, um, I like more photography, so I, I like to go outside and I like to take pictures and just like mm -hmm. kind of get lost in the town. Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I feel going outside is still very much a thing that me and my friends do. However, the phone is always brought with us, mm -hmm. so no matter how much you go outside or try go to a park for a walk or just out with your friends the phone is always there and it's always buzzing and it's always pinging. So even if you're at home, you're sort of spending the same amount of time on technology at home and mm -hmm. at, at outside. Mm -hmm. So it sort of follows you everywhere you go, which is really sad to think, mm -hmm. but it's the truth. So. Mm -hmm. And I think in relation to that, if you're going out at night, you automatically would bring your phone. Your parents would say, take your phone so I can contact you. So I know mm -hmm. that you can just send me a text if you're out mm -hmm. late at night. Mm -hmm. Let me know you're safe. Mm -hmm. So like Alicia said, your phone comes with you everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. So we've got, so in terms of advice, we've got restrictions don't work, education does, and so does modeling healthier behavior. Mm -hmm. Pretty good advice so far. Anything else? Want to add? To anybody else want to toss anything? Just something that they've implemented in my school for the year sevens in yeah. particular. Um, they noticed that the girls around school would always have their phones anywhere. They couldn't go to lunch without them. They couldn't go to lessons without them. So they said to them, from the times of eight thirty to four thirty, which was our school times, um, your phone stays in your locker. You can't have it out once you're out of school times, yep, you can use it however much you want, but just in that time where you need to interact with people and learn like face-to-face -face communication, mm -hmm. you don't want your phone to pro be problematic. And is that just for the middle school, junior, seven eighths? Like now that you're in high school, is, does the same rule apply? Um, so that was just implemented for the particular year sevens mm -hmm. um, because they noticed there was a yep. big problem with that. Yep. Um, but I guess everyone else has the choice. They can leave it in their lockers or take but it. There is a debate, isn't there, about whether phones should be banned in school, in British schools altogether. And I think they have been banned in French right. schools. So, and various other places are debating it. So. Should we just have a ban? Would that make life simpler, or would it cause uh, a problem? You know, it depends. Um, in my school, um, only the high schoolers are allowed to have their phones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at times, if I'm like in maths class or something like that, and I don't really want to pull out like a full scientific calculator, I just do like the four function on my phone, and I, f I just find that useful. Can I ask you one more question, then we're going to uh, Willow's going to go to the audience. So, Ezra, this is to your point about information and education being key. How much do you think it would help if we educated you and everybody else about how much the tech companies are spent time manipulating you by the apps? Because we have colleagues. No, no, no. Very seriously, guys. We, the, we have colleagues uh, from the top tech companies in the world who uh, have now come to work with us who basically feel, would tell you that, that the companies they work for are in an arms race for your attention that they intentionally design the most manipulative possible apps like Snapchat Freaks, for example, that some of you may partake in. And they are specifically designed to manipulate your behavior so you'll spend more time on their platform so they can make more money off of you because you're the product and they're selling your information to advertisers. If we told all the kids in the UK, your age and younger about that, do you think that would be helpful in terms of framing some of your guys' use of those devices? Long question, but you get the point. Um, I think nowadays people's attention spans are just so short that they're constantly looking for more entertainment. So I feel kids knowing this, that companies are purposely going out of their way to get children sort of addicted to their yep. platforms. I feel it wouldn't really affect kids in such a big way because they already know that this app is here to <coughs> entertain me. I want constant entertainment. So if that stopped, then kids would be upset and bored, like we said earlier. So I think in a way, in a kind of weird, twisted way, kids would be appreciative that these platforms are doing that to keep <laughs> themselves constantly entertained. Yeah. So yeah, with kids' attention spans being so short these days, I think uh, any form of entertainment they're happy with and they're happy to continue using it. <laughs> 
certain apps aren't just for one thing anymore. Correct. You look at Snapchat, it started as you can just send pictures to each other and now you can look at news, you can yeah. it's a social media platform, yeah. you know, they have stories, you know, Snapchat stories where you can look at people you follow and see that what they're doing in their day. You know, the technology now isn't just about one thing on one platform. It's such a widespread thing. You guys are awesome. I agree. Thank you yeah. for Thank sharing you. your wisdom with us today. Just we have a couple of minutes. I didn't know if um, any of you all had questions that you wanted to ask. And I'm Direct them to whoever you want. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Maybe back there, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Ellen Helsberg, work with Sonia at the Media and Communications Department at the LSE. My question was a little bit about the the kind of people who are not here yes. in this room are represented, um, because you all seem to have really lovely families and you have discussions about this. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering also, because you were mentioning kind of the vulnerable um, teens and other young people, because this is all very nice, but I'm not really sure that it would work for a lot of people who can't have these kinds of conversations mm -hmm. with their parents, who actually, when they are at home, also Definitely. kind of need yeah. to escape, or who have really problematic relationships with, uh, with their peers. I'm just wondering, in your research and in, maybe in your experiences, uh, without naming names or anything, obviously, of uh, individuals, but uh, what of the research that you've done or of your experiences says what the specific problems might be for the kind of more vulnerable uh, teenagers or young people and this type of technology and if there's any advice that you might have um, in that regard. Well, first of all, I want to say that it, when we think about where we go next with this global mapping study, we recognize that we've chosen right three countries in the right. developed countries in the global north to kind of get our grounding, but where we head next will look very different um, to get a sense of how, in particular, different regions and different cultures um, are adapting to these new technologies. So that's something we're, that we're very focused on in the future. And we did do some um, targeting in terms of this data. So um, by obviously by gender, by ethnicity, by employment status, yeah. um, and by socioeconomic status. So, so that, and we're happy to make that data available if if you all want to do a little digger deeping into the substrata. Um, but I think your point is a really important one, which is we're, we're talking to this extraordinary, lovely, right. eloquent group of students um, and don't mean for them to represent all young people and particularly the vul vulnerable ones. Um, as you might imagine, we didn't pre-screen for vulnerability um, with this particular group, but understanding that it is of <laughs> vital importance, as is, ac as is um, equal access um, yeah. to the technology as well. But I'm sure. And I'm just going to tell you. I mean, as at Common Sense, as a big, uh, the biggest advocacy group on these issues, a we spent three years r uh, building and running a commission to wire every classroom in America with broadband so all kids would have that. It's an access issue because mm -hmm. I'm sure they have it at the American School or at um, Dulwich. Correctly Dulwich. pronounced there. <laughs> uh, but but there are a lot of places where they don't. So we actually and it, it cost the U.S. government uh, many billions of dollars to do it, but we required them to do it. The second thing, as Willow mentioned, is that the, when we're with the next countries we're looking at, the global mapping studies are not. Uh, are not uh, like the UK or the US or Japan, and we think they're gonna have really big. And the third thing is we, pro we spend millions of dollars a year at Common Sense on reaching out to low-income audiences and to Latino audiences in particular, because we feel it's incredibly important that this not, not just be from the kids who are getting the best education and the best opportunities to have the most engaged parents, whatever. So I think you raise an incredibly important mm -hmm. issue. And the work we're gonna do over here with folks like you at LSE and elsewhere is gonna be focused on reaching everybody uh, because the, uh, you, what you raise is really important. Yeah, thank you. I mean, maybe I can just mm -hmm. add, I mean, I think the question of inequality is absolutely Huge. crucial. Um, but um, Ellen and I have, have analyzed British data um, looking at questions of vulnerability and resilience before, and that's quite a kind of live debate here. And one of the things that's interesting is that there are all kinds of vulnerabilities. And some of them, if you like, are developmental. And many young people, grown-ups too, will know, you know there, are, there are points in your life when you are particularly vulnerable, even if you come from an affluent background Correct. or in a good, you know. It can, so it's kind of hard to predict. And I think that's one of the things that's really 
difficult for policymakers and sometimes for parents too, that you don't know, you know, when that kind of Correct. particular vulnerability is going to occur. And online, there are all kinds of resources, as many of us have debated, that play into that and amplify the risks and, you know, can really generate problems. So that's why I said at the start, you know, I think we should be shifting the focus to what are the kind of particular problems that phones can give rise to, as it were, rather than talking really generically about on or off in school or not in school. That's kind of too broad for for the nuance that we know. And I think one of the things that's been clear in even in just our limited set of studies is mm. that there is a developmental vulnerability mm. around mm. this grade. Absolutely. Around this grade seven, we really saw that mm. emerge very strongly in mm. Japan, where also that age aligns with a real pressure point, an right. academic pressure right. point yeah. um, as as well. Yes, we're let's take one more. We're, we're time constraints, so let's take one more question, yeah, and then we have a surprise ending for you. <laughs> So Sarah, and then maybe we'll let Charles, maybe we'll do two. Okay, Sarah two more. The mic two more, and then, and then if you'll a couple minutes, and then we're going to have a fun ending. Okay, I'll be very quick. Um, um, thank you. This was really, really um, helpful and interesting. I was just wondering, Willow, in the study, um, in the study, the, the, the questions were about kids and parents. And so you have the percentages and the data that is about parents' use and kids' use. Uh, what a lot of you talked about and and you as well was actually the use of the phone in the forging of the relationship between the child and the parent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than you know it, it, not not just are you are are your parents distracted are your kids distracted but text me when you get home where are you mm -hmm. or just general i need you you know that kind of thing and so i was wondering if you had a question there that was about the relationship how the phone what role the phone plays or the you know texting or snapchat or whatever plays in the relationship between the child and the parent no we don't specifically but we will what we asked was yeah no 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 um, we asked does it help does it hurt or does it make no difference and i think I i'm surprised by the preponderance of right the findings that suggest that it makes no difference or help yeah. and i think that's something that we very much want to explore moving forward helps how and and what does that mean and is it is it is it also the kind of shared experience of integrating this technology um, individually but also together let's do one more question by the way we have a different set of research that we just did in the US mm -hmm. on social yeah, that social touches media. on that about mm -hmm. social media that that we could share with you afterwards. Uh, Samira's holding it there in the front Samira, row. give it to Sarah. Which, Perfect. Sarah, and which, which <laughs> touches on a lot of those issues, Thanks. and which we could include in some of the future studies mm -hmm. that we do in collaboration with USC. One more question, and then we're going to do a very quick Got the mic. video. Um, I'm Charles Himes from the Daily Telegraph. <coughs> I've got a question for the students, for each of the students, and it's off the record. Um, <laughs> what is the most popular site that you and your peers use? And which is the site that you would advise people to stay away from, mm. or children to stay away from? So which are the most popular that you use, and which is the one that you would say to your friends or to younger people, you should <coughs> not use that site or app? You don't have to answer. <laughs> uh, so my personal most used website would probably be YouTube, because it can be... Uh, used for a range of things. It's not just mm. entertainment, it's also education and information. Mm. Uh, so it, it can be really useful for doing research, things like that. Uh, if I wanted to pick one to stay away from, mm. I reckon it would probably be Instagram because it's, it's so easy to spend a lot of time on there and it mm. provides very little, I mean, I, I'm guilty of spending a lot of time on Instagram myself. So I don't think it provides a great deal back in return, yeah. except for maybe feelings, feelings of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. Good. Good yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree more and then we're gonna end with that Instagram, mm -hmm. should, there should be a sign. Stay away, Stay from, away from Instagram. Okay. Although that's, I do that's use the headline. as well. Um, Why is that I, off the record? I think that's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> like Charles is writing the headline now. <laughs> but I, I would say I use Snapchat quite a bit. And that's mainly because that's how I would message my yeah, friends. Yeah, we don't yeah, really yeah. use iMessage anymore. I mean, I do with my yeah, parents, yeah. but with my friends, okay. that's our platform for communication. And I also think that I know that companies tailor what we see on Snapchat to fit what we want to see. And so we just find ourselves finding more things. However, 
Snapchat does offer news and things to read about so we, we can still get something out of it rather than just looking at photos on Instagram and being like, oh, I wish I was there rather than studying, you know, so I think that. Do you get news from Snapchat? Yeah, you can subscribe. No, I, to... I know you can. I meant do you. I do, I do. I mean, I wouldn't say it's that reliable. I mean, sometimes I look at Daily Mail and I mean, it's just amusing, but <laughs> I wouldn't say I would believe everything I read from that side. There's always a limit, but I think that it's better than just looking at photos on Instagram. Any, any other things yeah. that should be banned? Is anything he? to stay away from? Um, in terms of websites to stay away from, I would think anyone that has um, endless scrolling feature, because mm -hmm. um, mm. that kind of just never ends. Um, and I would think that uh, one of the better ones would be Snapchat, because like there comes like an end to like <laughs> who you Snapchat, <laughs> like how many people's stories you view, the news, mm -hmm. like you can read all of it and then like you're kind of be like done and bored. But with like Facebook and Instagram, like that never ends. And so you mm -hmm. can spend like up to five hours on there without really realizing. I'm gonna throw something controversial out there. Yeah. My favorite is actually Instagram. <laughs> I think because one, it's you get a connection with certain people, you kind of, you don't get invested in their lives, but you get to see how they live, sort of. And I think for the younger generation, Instagram has become the new Facebook. Right. Um, you know, I barely use Facebook other than for yeah. looking at events and stuff. I connect yeah. with people on Instagram. If I meet someone, it'd be, oh, what's your Instagram? Not, oh, add me on Facebook. Um, and then for me, I'd say the worst one um, is something like, Ask FM, like mm -hmm. an anonymous right, thing, right, right, because right, right, you get right. lots of, mm -hmm. it can be quite hurtful if you get Definitely. the wrong sort mm -hmm. of people using it. So yeah. that's my yeah. yeah, yeah. And just to add on, Instagram, or at least for me recently, I've seen this new feature where at one point, once you, as you keep scrolling, you get a notification where it says um, you've seen all the content from the past two days. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really <laughs> cool. <just laughs> <laughs> It gives you an end. Yeah. I haven't seen it recently, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just can, it says, yeah, basically yeah. stop looking at it. Yeah. So more things like that, That's I guess, pretty, would be more useful. Yeah. Pretty good. Alessi, you get the last word. Um, going back to Ask FM, that's a site that I definitely stay away from. Right. In yeah. fact, when it was, I'm not sure if it's too popular anymore, but when right. it was the craze sort of in year nine, so when I was around 14 yeah. years old, I even asked my parents, oh, can I get it? And they said, absolutely not, because mm -hmm. I feel online, especially, it's so easy to hide behind a screen, but on Instagram, Snapchat, people know who you are, yeah. unless you're yeah. out there making strange profiles. People know who you are on Instagram and Snapchat, whereas on Ask FM it's all completely anonymous. Yeah. So right. it's just so easy to bully, bully and sort of making an account is is asking for just right. nasty comments and things like that. So. You will be happy to know that we went heavily after Ask FM yeah. in the United States and damaged their business ex heavily, yeah. and I'm very proud that we did that. Okay, before yeah. we leave, we have a we have a we're going to show you a couple of ads featuring not only a graduate of the University of Southern California, but the graduation speaker in 27 at USC graduation exercises. And this is part of our device-free dinner campaign. So hopefully the volume is big enough and hopefully you will recognize these ads. What's wrong, sweetheart? I miss daddy. I know, we all miss him. I miss him more. No, no, I miss him the most. I miss him a lot. No, no more. I, I, miss I him. literally I miss, I miss him. I miss, I miss him more. so hey, much more. Hey, everyone shut up. The, this filter makes me look like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It's making me cry. <laughs> yeah. So, sweetie, tell me about your day. Well, today, actually, I was driving to the grocery store, and I saw a dog. Oh, you saw a dog? Daddy, put your phone in the basket. The basket's so crowded, though. Just put it in. Oh, wait. Put it in the basket. In the basket. Put it in the basket, right? It's an easy thing. Just put it in the basket. Please put it in the basket. Thanks. All right. Let's see what we can get this meal. Dinner as long as it's time. in the basket, though, I can technically still touch it, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Willow and Sonia. And, and, and you guys. Our thank you guys Bravo. very much. Bravo.